Emma and Stuart with, um, well, thin pickings at the moment. Clearly, they're all uh, waiting to get the sports reporting in, which is why we ought to, I guess, congratulate the Sunday Telegraph for getting the, well, the try-in as well as the headline there on the top of their page. Um, but nevertheless, it is the politics that take the four on the front page. And this is, um, well, to use that rugby euphemism, putting the boot into John McDonnell, it seems. Mm, yes, no, it, it seems like it's quite an interesting investigation done by some uh, Sunday Telegraph journalists looking at what John McDonnell, Andrew Fisher, who's the new polit political advisor of uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and John Ross, uh, who's a sort of economic expert and ally, ha have said over the past few years and sort of you know ah so it's not in recent times well exactly this is the thing so between 2010 and 2012 uh, John McDonnell uh, they they say that he called at least three times for an insurrection to bring down the government I mean we don't know the context no. of that whether you know whether he was joking whether it was you know you know actual you know what, what he was referring to at the time but um, you know, he, he said some he said some things which you know, do seem to be good you know. journalism, or just fairly easy, just to trawl through past speeches and pick out various quotes and sections at random and say, you know, this is what he said about the government. And well, I don't know. I think the Sunday Telegraph are not the only people going through back uh, copies of magazines and newspapers they probably never read before in their life. Like I think somebody joked today that no one had ever read the Morning Star quite vociferously <laughs> as uh, Conservative Central Office had for for articles that. Uh, that Jeremy Corbyn has written. I think some of these incidents relate to the demonstrations by students. Do you remember that was only a couple of years ago? But I mean, again, it's a taste of what Corbyn is going to have to get used to. And of course, it's interesting that he, he's uh, something he did, did today. He made a mention uh, in, you know, he just made a few remarks today mm. uh, of an incident involving, I think, a Sinn Fein woman MP who died. You know, one of the first I think, women MPs. He's not going to play down that side of him, is he? It's not, it's not as though he's self-censoring. He's giving people the politics of protest. The po yeah, the he, he is yeah. absolutely yeah. committed to yeah. the politics of protest, and therefore we will see more and more of this. I think of past things he says, and also looking out for little things he says. At, However, at it did hit home when they um, publicised what John McDonnell said about the IRA, and McDonnell then had yes. to apologise publicly for causing any offence. Now. Does that mean that they will be looking at every utterance he's made to try and, well, basically blacken his name, I guess? I, I, presume, I presume they will be do, trying to do that. Um, the, the question, though, also is you know, whether the new Labour members, who have sort of joined up in the, to the party you know, in, in, in huge numbers, yeah. whether they will actually be affected by this. I mean, sort of... In, in terms I, they'll say it's the Sunday Telegraph. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Exactly, and I think I think the sort of you know polling data showed that you know they got you know the, the sort of new voters for Corbyn got most of their news through social media. So this will obviously appear That's on so point, social media. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, but, so it's you know, a different constituency. Possibly, yes, exactly. It's sort of it's it's th these will obviously you know the newspapers will will, will come out and you know, will want to try and you know as you say, sort of blacken the name. But you know, whether it will affect the Labour members is, is another question. Yeah. And I, think, I think, Mark, that goes to the story in The Observer, yeah. where mm. basically he's, he's making the point is that actually it's the people who voted him in who will have to vote him out yeah. if, if they want to do that. Um, and, I mean, it is odd to see a, a, a new party leader interviewed uh, so soon being asked if he's about to resign. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and not, not actually making those comments on social media, but talking to yeah, a broadsheet yeah. Sunday newspaper. Exactly. Um, but, I mean, the, the, the dynamic is in interesting, isn't it? As you say, before he's even talked to conference, he's actually acknowledging the calls, if you like, for him to step down. Mm. Yeah. But, but saying that, you know, he was, as you say, he was elected by, you know, a clear majority. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, I've always thought this is the problem with this uh, um, uh, system of election in the Labour Party, is if he were to fall for some reason or another, the same people could vote somebody similar in again. Well, this is the thing. I mean, yeah. I thought the, the Labour Party rules anyway were that he had to stay there for a year before they, there was a vote of no confidence. And then they'd have to do a whole, a whole you know, leadership election again, which would then on, take... On the same basis. Presumably so. So, I mean, and so if, if these new... New, these new party members and affiliated supporters are, you know, pro Corbyn or pro, you know, the line that he's taking. Then there's, there's no, there's no, you know, guarantee that there'll be a sort of more centre-right candidate that was put in his place. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's an interesting um, sort of, uh, shall we say, process going on where he's again. He said there is a democratic process in the party, and that can be operated any time. But am I going to resign? He seems to be using this as his fallback position. Oh, this is democracy. Everyone can have their say, and obviously we will observe whatever the vote is. Now, the, the problem is that negates leadership.
you can't be a leader and, and just go with the way that the well, wind that's blows. that's why, why like. it's going to be such a fascinating conference mm. to see how it plays yeah. out. I mean, I'm old enough to have you know, covered party conferences when there was constant confusion on, on the floor, sure. which was, a, you know, in, in the news media, we love it when the leadership you know, is, over, is voted down, don't we? Yeah. And then, we, of course, we had the whole Mandelson style of party conference management where everything was vetted in the black yeah. Yeah. Now we're going back, you know, 20, 30 years to where there's going to be votes and you don't know which way. Because, as you say, Mark, we don't know actually quite what the leader thinks on a certain issue yeah. and he doesn't seem to want to assert his view he wants to allow the party to have their say it all goes to the same agenda of actually these are the people who voted for me let them have their yeah. say as no in prime minister's questions the, the, absolutely yeah. but no one's yeah. ever run a party like that before yeah. yeah well funny you should mention mr mandelson because the inside pages of uh the mail page 10 and 11 peter mandelson yesterday accused jeremy corbyn of trying to con voters in putting a quasi-Marxist into Downing Street. Uh, latest broadside aimed at the Labour chief uh, dismissed Mr Corbyn as a symbol, not a leader. Mm. Yes. I mean, it does seem sort of... You know, he, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Yeah. Well, some may say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, obviously there is a big question about whether the Labour can be unified under under Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, not 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 all the MPs voted for him. You know, yeah. Actually, it was very small. Well, Simon small Danjuk number. there, Labour MP for Rochdale, indicating that, you know, deluded... Uh, is his phrase exactly but at the same time he has only been in the post for two weeks so it does seem that it is rather it's rather soon to sort of call for him to step down or to sort of you know we should perhaps wait and see what his policies are and how how he deals with with this sort yeah of but is, is that significant in itself and on the eve of conference Harriet Harman who was interim leader coming out all guns blazing on the lack of women uh, in the shadow cabinet which she could have done earlier but she chooses the moment the night before the conference to actually issue this broadside yes. i mean that that's pretty damning isn't yeah. it didn't she because uh, well absolutely but wasn't it also her issue was also the the, the you know the mayoral candidate was male you know yep. that it was uh, the four the four main ones and should have she acknowledged that you know these were all different contests and they all won those differently but perhaps you know they needed to change further so i mean although, that is, although the chief whip is, is a woman so yeah. who was you know there but i mean what will happen as all this builds? I mean, is this something that, that could create a sort of critical mass, if you like? Or is Corbyn just going to say, well, we knew this was going to happen and just, you know, we'll see where we are by the end of the week? What does it do? What's the dynamic for a party? In well, I mean, most, most political parties in this situation would be really worried about what the media was saying. Yeah. But I don't, I'm not entirely sure that they are. And so, they, you know, they're presumably going to get a kicking in most of the, of the, uh, of the certainly of the centre and right-wing press, day after day. But I suspect if it feels good on the conference floor, mm. which it probably will, mm. given the kind of support he has, that will probably carry them through. Yeah. yeah. And um, there is the question about, you know, the, the, are the media getting rather overexcited when they go to the lengths of actually photographing the shadow health minister, Heidi Alexander, uh, with a three-mile race in South London, and then spoiling all her good work by appearing to munch on a chocolate hobnob afterwards. I mean, mm. is that really that important? Yeah, I don't think that's really necessary. No. Do you know, that. I mean, that is going really for... Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, OK, let's move on to another inside page on the Mail on Sunday in terms of political balance. Page six, Squealer Ashcroft wanted to become defence minister. Another war of words going on yeah. with the Tory party. I mean, yeah. What I love about this story is that we're all week we've had the, the Daily Mail serialising Lord Ashcroft's book. Then we have the Mail on Sunday, a different part of the empire, in a sense calling him Squealer Ashcroft because he's sold his book to the uh, Daily Mail. Yeah. Um, the point, particular point is that uh, during the week it's not, it was made reference a number of times that he expected a job uh, and, and a senior job from David Cameron never got it. Uh, the Mail on Sunday saying that the job he expected to get was Minister of Defence. Mm. Uh, he is uh, something of an expert. I think he has the largest collection of Victoria Crosses in the world, etc. But on the other hand, to have a peer as a Defence Secretary, I can't remember when we last no. had mm. a peer on the front bench. So uh, that was a bit naive if he ever expected yeah, that. Yeah, is, is it fair to say that probably Cameron has survived the onslaught a week on? That clearly, you know, last Sunday with the revelations mm. from Isabel Oakeshott's mm. serialisation of the book, um, Central Office were obviously sort of manning the barricades but it seems to have calmed down a bit now I, th I think so I mean I think that it, it's sort of um, you know, particular revelations that, that you know, did seem to be quite hard to substantiate you know that you know they were based on you know someone telling someone else and I think that that you know has has sort of you know diminished their their, their force as it were 
Uh, but again, it's sort of a bit similar to the, the Corbyn um, yeah. phenomenon in that I think a lot of people you know, who voted Conservative, you know, they, they do know that Cameron went to, David Cameron went to Oxford, they do know he and went he, to he Eton. Was, he was, yeah, he was posh. He exactly. went to Eton, he went to Oxford and Bullingdon Club, etc. And that, that was known, it yes. wasn't hidden. But um, exactly. clearly what happens behind closed doors was uh, the unknown factor. However, uh, still to come, why there's yet more bad news for Britain's diesel drivers. We'll be firing that up in a moment for you. Welcome back to our press preview Sunday papers with Emma and Stuart. As we head back to the Observer, uh, and we're going to look on the right-hand side column now, the latest on the, well, is it diplomacy? Um, on basically acknowledging that Assad's going to have to stay in power for this to work. Yes, so it's, it's basically the idea that David Cameron will be speaking at the United Nations to sort of suggest that, you know, Bashar al-Assad al will have to, to be in power for a period of time, sort of interim period. I mean, it seems quite tricky. I mean, the, the economist has always argued that, you know, he, for peace, he has to be out of power. Yeah. But then, you know, the precedents of, so 2003 in Iraq and 2011 in, Syria, in, in Libya show that, you know, getting rid of a dictator doesn't always So the vacuum lead. is more dangerous. It can be more dangerous. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of, it's, it's a difficult situation to know exactly how to deal with. Could it also be realpolitik that the fact that the Russians have dumped vast amounts of sophisticated weapons at Mr Assad's feet that perhaps we couldn't even take him out if we wanted to in terms of any military engagement? Yes, I think there's also a suggestion that the Americans have been moving in this direction and, and possibly other uh, nations. So in a sense, Cameron is possibly following a tide rather than setting a trend here yeah. and, and accepting that Assad has a role in a transition. Uh, I've never entirely understood why uh, a sort of leader of a country like that would actually sign up for transition yeah because uh, yeah. if uh, without actually effectively then trying to obstruct the transition but uh, yeah. you see especially as most of the civilians that have been killed have been killed by you know his his forces and yeah. most of the refugees are esca escaping and, and it's his the rather bombs. tricky question after the yeah. transition what do you do with him yeah. where yeah. does he go yeah. what is his status yeah. 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 I mean, looking at what's happened to Gaddafi and, and others yeah. and, and well, I'm Saddam sure Hussein. I'm sure the Russians can help out if he, if he wants to well, go and live in Russia. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, let's move uh, back to another front page, the Sunday Telegraph, um, because there's more on this. Uh, Cameron drops demand for Assad to go as he targets ISIL. Mm -hmm. Now, again, this is going back to the difficulty because, of course, we remember that Parliament voted against any direct military mm -hmm. intervention in Syria. But is there an indication that, the, the again, the political tide is changing that perhaps more people might consider that now yeah. well I think certainly the migrant sort of the refugee crisis has has really sort of you know changed changed some minds but obviously one of the big the big questions here is is, is so Jeremy Corbyn is, is, is against all intervention yeah. in Syria so or a, yeah. intervention anywhere yes. yeah yeah so yeah. so whether this will actually be able to be passed through is is is, is sort of you know I, I think still probably up in the air yeah yeah, I mean, the, the other and, thing... Unless he allows a free vote inside his own party, I suppose, but then yes. you, yeah. it can be fairly messy. The, the yeah. other thing is we, we are not really getting an indication, perhaps, yeah. uh, from Washington if there is an appetite to really go for um, any direct intervention. That It seems that, to them, Syria is still very far away. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a foreign policy objective rather than something that really is, you know, yeah. uh, at their immediate doorstep. Yeah. Well, I suppose their first priority has got to be to support the government in Iraq, which they sort of, they remember they chucked out the previous yeah. guy and put somebody else in. I'm sure it was all democratically done. Yeah. So that, I mean, obviously they would like to, 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 to have some impact in Syria as well. So but, they're, but they're looking at that side of the border rather than... Yeah, I would yeah. have thought that inevitably. This yeah. case. OK, let's uh, head for another paper that's in, which is the Mail on Sunday. But it is now all those front pages of the Sunday papers and joining us once more, the economist Britain correspondent Emma Hogan and former news executive and Ofcom uh, regulator Stuart Purvis. Thanks for being with us tonight. As ever, the front pages first of all those papers. We'll start with The Observer. It carries an exclusive interview with the new Labour leader ahead of that party conference in Brighton. Jeremy Corbyn telling the paper he's got what it takes to be Prime Minister. The Sunday Telegraph says that key members of his team uh, have supported what they call insurrection and rioting against the police. It uh, reports the Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, among those that the paper has accused of condoning violence. It's another member of the Shadow Cabinet, Shadow Culture Secretary, this time taking to the front page of the Sunday Times, expressing his fear that Labour will be taken over by infighting as the hard left carry out a purge of the party. Independent goes with the warning from Mr Corbyn's economics advisor that Labour is weak on tax 
and that the Tories will steal Labour's best policies. Mail on Sunday reporting on the rise of so-called virgin births, claiming they've talked to doctors who say at least 25 women who've never had sex have nevertheless given birth by undergoing IVF. Sunday Express reporting some experts say patients should think carefully about taking statins, with warnings that the heart disease drug may make you age faster. Or is it just reading the Sunday Express that does that? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Sunday Times first is the punishment beatings to split Labour, which is a rather dramatic headline. What does it actually mean in practice? Yes, well, it seems to be that there might be the possibility of a forced reselection for ah. the, those who are critical of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, it, you know, this, this, this is something that you know is not necessarily definitely going to happen. Don McDonnell, the shadow um, chancellor, has, yeah. has said that he'd not oppose the introduction of forced reselection, declaring that it's for the party to, to decide. So, Labour moderates are, are slightly worried about whether you know the new sort of grassroots movement from Labour. And they see it as a purge by the hard left, effectively. Yeah. Well, that's how I mean, he would see it, presumably Corbyn, if, he agree, if it went ahead, and McDonnell as part of the further democratisation, as they would see, of the party. But it's that's the, the active phrase. That's remember, yeah, yeah. But of course, it's the fact that um, Michael Duger, the shadow cultural secretary, uses this phrase, punishment beatings. I mean, that is an extraordinary phrase to use about what other people in the party would see as a democratic process. And it shows the, you know, how thin this veneer of unity is that people, a shadow, a, a shadow you know, front bencher would use a phrase like that about a plan which his own colleague on the front bench appears yeah. to be in favour of. And you've, you've also spotted an interesting third paragraph there where the Sunday Times says that many far-left groups, Alliance for Workers' Liberty, Marxist Trotskyist organisation, Left Unity, that they basically have decided to climb on board Labour, that they don't see themselves as being separate a anymore. Yes, you have to remember, under the Labour Party rules, you cannot join the Labour Party if you're a member of another political party. And so these very small, I mean, we'll almost call them factions rather than parties, they do exist. At least one, it says, has wound itself up and saying, look, go and join the Labour Party, you're yeah. free to join. And another one, Left Unity, uh, is apparently going to do the same thing. Yeah. That is only going to increase the number of people from the far left who are part of the, part of the activists inside the Labour Party. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, apologies for the station announcements going on in the newsroom, however. Uh, we'll, we'll carry on. Uh, the story now arriving on The Independent on Sunday, page two. Uh, is there, mm. uh, and this is more on John McDonald, but basically the, the hard economics, if you like. Yeah. Um, Shadow Charlton must set up tax plans, say supporters. Well, one would imagine that's what he's going to do at the party conference, one would yeah, hope. Exactly. What, what I find very interesting about this is that, you know, not only would uh, John McDonald have said that he'd come out in favour of Osborne's sort of fiscal charter, but he's also said that, you know, they will, they will sort of run it, there'll be a surplus in current spending rather than the overall uh, spending. And that's basically the exact same uh, plans that Ed Balls had, basically to just to balance the current budget. Which so, is what they acknowledged lost in the election, is it not? Yes. Or am I being rather unfair on that? Well, I mean, the, well, there, there is a case to be made for saying that, you know, infrastructure investment is, is, is sort of needed. The big capital spend. Exactly. Like, yeah. and, and certainly doing it through sort of, you know, balancing the current budget rather than the overall budget, rather than the plans for people's quantitative easing of sort of printing money for infrastructure investment. People's bank. Yes, yeah. is, is, is a more sensible idea. And yet they're against HS2, which would be the biggest capital spend you could actually engineer, if you pardon the phrase. Yes, I mean, that might be because, and I, I'm not sure why they're against HS2, but it might yeah. be because they, they see the other investment, incremental investment in sort of, you know, the Northern Powerhouse, for example, might be, might have a better sort of benefit cost ratio and sort of actually provide more to, to people you know, in the long run. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a word of warning here, but paragraph three, some tax experts believe that Mr. McDonald would have to go high in terms of personal taxation, mm -hmm. perhaps to a 60% tax rate on uh, those over 100,000. Yeah. Uh, and one remembers, of course, I think, was it Dennis Healy, that they were going to squeeze until the pips... pips. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, clearly that may be one of the things that the, the media is going to watch for this week. Yes. And, I mean, as you say, John Crodas, you know, Labour Party sort of, you know, advisor, he, he did do research showing that, you know, Labour's position yeah. on austerity didn't, didn't help them, basically. OK. Uh, just so. in case people are going to accuse us of Labour bashing, let's go for a bit of Tory bashing. Uh, as some might see it, page six of the Mail on Sunday, an inside page, which is the latest on uh, the Tory difficulties, uh, which has, seems to have disappeared uh, here. 
Uh, however, uh, there it is. Because it's page six and seven, a yeah. double page spread. Yes. Squealer Ashcroft yes. wanted well, to become defence minister. Well, both those uh, six and seven are quite interesting. Uh, six, I mean, the point in the male serialisation of, of this book uh, about David Cameron, co authored by Lord Ashcroft, remember it said that Lord Ashcroft was terribly disappointed yeah. not to have got a major job. Uh, the Mail on Sunday is saying that that job was defence minister. Uh, he's a man who's got a lot of interest in defence, but the idea that a member of the House of Lords would become defence minister was perhaps always rather optimistic on his behalf. And it's interesting that, given that the mail, on, the mail during the week has had this exclusive, to see the words squealer Ashcroft, in other words, you sell the story to the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday calls you a squealer. And on the right-hand side, there's a story uh, arguing that the book has got something wrong. I, I should declare an interest that my publisher is the same publisher. My understanding, actually, it's the serialisation that got a certain fact wrong, not the book. So, I, the Daily is, Mail. Uh, I, the Daily Mail. So we've right. got a sort of, something's going on inside Daily Mail headquarters, I think. Um, is it is it true to say though that Cameron has survived this week? Because clearly, you know, there were worries in Conservative Central Office last week that when it broke on Sunday, that it could be long-term damage to the Prime Minister as a result of this. I, I think I think I think the Conservative Party have weathered it, and I think that it's partly because you know, some of those the claims were found to be sort of rather you know, unsubstantiated. And Cameron made a joke of it yes. as well on several occasions in terms of speeches. Yes. So yeah. that was the approach he took. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, of the uh, particular issue of, of Mr Ashcroft, I mean, would it be fair to say that really there was no political expertise that he had that would have come into play in any important position in government, or was that...? Well, I, I mean, he, I think he was offered what appears to be a sort of junior foreign office yeah, yeah. job, which is appropriate for the junior, House Junior Lords. whip, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. well, he, I think it's suggested it slightly higher. Right. But let, let's be clear, he was a very controversial figure uh, and, uh, you know, it was always going to be a sort of hot potato for whichever party leader eventually got into power what they did with him. Um, Despite but, the amount of money he poured into the party. Well, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. we all know that's, you know, that's, that's the thing party leaders have to handle. Yeah. OK, uh, back to the front pages now. Uh, the Observer. Uh, more Corbyn on the left, if you pardon the expression. But on the right, uh, the latest on Syria and the sort of geopolitics where there is a growing acknowledgement that maybe Assad's got to be left in position to avoid this sort of danger of a vacuum forming. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it seems that, you know, David Cameron is going to announce at the United Nations that, you know, yeah, as you say, Assad will have to stay for some point in interim period. But it, it, it seems quite, you know, Worrying that you know Assad, who who has been bombing you know his people, refugees are leaving partly because of you know his 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 sort of warfare on his own country would be would be left there. I mean, so what? How to, how how would that be dealt with? It's sort of your enemy's enemy has suddenly become your friend. Um, I'm not sure that's the way they'd like to see it, but it seems that we've got that process, got through that process because in a sense, if if uh, ISIS or ISIL is is his enemy and we're against them, that somehow yeah. we seem to be you know inevitably arriving in some kind of coalition with him. And the, the point is that they, everyone wants him out. It's the question is, are you actually going to get him around the table uh, to, to, to go immediately, or do you have to offer him some role in a transition government? That's what mm. seems to be now the Western powers in general are coming around to that policy. Mm. And, of course, the Russians are, are, are on the spot uh, yeah. trying to keep him in place. Yeah, yeah and there's, there's more. Uh, the Telegraph has got this uh, as well on the, on the front page, uh, going with similar uh, sentiments, major shift in policy, but also indicating uh, that uh, perhaps, you know, there'll be a more direct effort to defeat Islamic State. Now, I mean, is it possible that we could actually launch some kind of uh, concerted front with the Russians? Because uh, that would basically be exceeding to ba uh, Bashar al-Assad being in power, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, I think that would be very worrying. Uh, but the, the, I mean, the, I, part of the reason for, I think, um, you know, particularly America's sort of reluctance to get involved in, in, in this is that, you know, the precedents are not great either. You know, 2003 Iraq, 2011 Libya. You know, getting rid of dictators can, as you say, lead to a vacuum. And so, really, you know, and you know, whether you know, Islamic State would fill it is, is, is a sort of worrying, worrying notion. Yeah, but of course, the, the dynamic has changed since the last parliamentary vote. Because, as you pointed mm -hmm. out, Emma, now that you've got tens, hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of refugees and migrants moving from Syria, it's concentrating minds in Western capitals like never before. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, we'll have to see what, what comes of that, and particularly Jeremy Corbyn's response as well to sort of you know, intervening in Syria, whether, whether he will try and block that in Parliament. Yeah. I mean, the other consideration, bearing in mind what the military chiefs have said, is could we physically do it? 
uh, without huge uh, material support from the United States. I mean, have we got the capability of taking on yet another Middle Eastern war, which is what some people would say it would be? You would have thought there was very little appetite for it in Britain, but I think you, did, did, somebody had a poll this morning, maybe even been I think Sky, that reporting that actually a surprising number of British people... Yes, more than half, I think. Half yeah. ...thought there was an argument for troops on the ground as well, if I remember right. That was so Boots on the ground, yeah. Boots on the ground. So that, I mean, but I think that's all seen through the prism of attacking ISIS rather than you know, getting involved in the particulars of Assad versus the, yeah, the rebels. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, coming up in the second half, we're going to be doing a bit of star or is that planet gazing? Mm -hmm. Could there be water on the red planet? I think it's a question we've posed before. Mm -hmm. Have we got an answer this time? More coming up in a moment.